Well, good morning, Gabby Vivas. Thank you so much for joining me today on the Ridiculously Human podcast. Thank you for the invite. Thank you so much for having this space for us. No, my pleasure. Uh, so Gabby, as with uh, many of my previous guests, uh, we we kind of met on on Twitter and uh, I've kind of like been following you and, and really blown away by your story. And uh, I think uh, you just have like so much to to share with with us, uh, not just through your story, but um, through what you teach um, and the businesses that you run. Uh, but I'd like to just start off with growing up in Venezuela, right? Like, I feel like, you know, we get this kind of message that it was like, I don't know, kind of crazy, you know, kind of deprived um, growing up under, you know, guys like Chavez and Maduro. And, um, you know, you've written quite a bit about this. You actually wrote a tweet and I'm going to read it out. You said, um, crisis in Venezuela was the most difficult experience I could ever live. And the one I promised myself I would never live again. No food in my house, no opportunities, no strong money, no transportation, no electricity, no cell phone, no internet, no water. So I'd like to find out, was it like always like that? It was really hard times that every Venezuelan can relay with my story. Uh, most of us that we left in 2017, 2016, the country. Um, I come from a family that gave me everything they could. And my, my father was always the provider in my house. My mom was always the nurturing woman. But, you know, when your purchase of power is declining, lack of things like services start missing because of a government. I live uh, in Venezuela. I was born during Chavez regime in 1998. And I was born 19 of December and he won in December 10th. Since then, my mom always told me that everything changed. The way how the services were taken, the way how even the people mindset was, was thinking, and everything was deteriorating through the time. It was uh, a difficult moment of all of us where we never felt a hope, and the only hope was to get out of the country and to have a better opportunity to start from zero with our family. And most of people of my generation and they left without anything, just with the hope to find a good job, send money back to our families, and you know, just to forget the 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 past experience, which was um, not having anything when you used to have your family, your friends, and it was an obligation. It was an obligation to leave, and nowadays we see just as a souvenir. Wow. So like these days is everyone kind of living on the bread line? Like they, they don't have much money or is there still, you know, like in most countries, a separation of, of classes? In Venezuela, um, the salary, the, the, the current salary right now is $4. Before leaving Venezuela, I was earning $10, for example. And that was my motivation to actually leave the country is in extreme poverty and there are two bubbles. There is extreme poverty and richness and the rich people that are the ones that, first of all, they could be connected with the government or it could be people that actually they, they started, they had businesses in the past, but they continue and continue with their savings and trying to maintain their businesses. But Venezuela is not from what we heard back in the 80s or back in the 90s. It's completely devastated by that. And there's no young population. And when there's no young population, unfortunately, uh, there's no possibility for a country to survive or to actually accelerate a process of science or technology. So all the youngsters have pretty much left and they are in I don't know, other countries around the world. That, that, that's, that's insane that there's, that's what you say, like there's almost no hope now because they're gone. But is there this desire to go back at all? Most of us have returned to visit our families, but there's no intention to stay when it's still the electricity, water, any type of service that we can actually find close, like in Brazil, like in Colombia, we can have for or for you know the, the type of salary or we can pay for that 
So yeah, there are other minority that return and stay, but after two or three years, they said, no, there's no way that we are going to be staying here. We need to leave. And that's what's currently happening to people. There's still, there's every day, um, young population, young um, adults that decide to leave even in 2024. What can you buy for $4? And anything is subsidized. Only what is subsidized now, it's water, which is something that you mentioned, it still arrives once a day in many regions in Venezuela. So the people who live in Venezuela is through allowances. And most of them try and just, or most of them are not having good conditions. And I can speak from these people. I can speak from um, the society that was left, which is the the adults after their 50s or 60s, that they try their best to even go to other countries, but they were not having even the skills. They were not developing young skills to be hired and they return. Or they didn't have the support of anyone. And that's the population that just left and live in Venezuela. Wow. So, so I'm, I'm assuming like that people are just like not really happy at all. Uh, there doesn't seem like any hope. It's, it's almost like this nation has this foot on its head. It's really hard. It's, it's, um, it's, a, it's a reality when you go there and you can tell. And the situation with the mindset of Venezuelans in, inside of the country changed so much. It's not something that I just perceived. It was other people that when people that is stayed in Venezuela, they think that people outside um, earn so well. Like uh, we have uh, endless possibilities in the way that we have so much money. So the Venezuelan mindset right now is judgmental inside of the country and doesn't like uh, to see other people that are progressing outside unless they are asking you to help them. So the socialist mindset is now in that extreme, now even in the, in the, in the Venezuelan population that is there. And it's, it's more often that you see conflict of families that they left the country five, seven years ago and they don't longer speak to the relative in Venezuela because the relative in Venezuela ask them for money or ask them to help them. And at the end, that creates an inf- um, like a, a problem and they call communication, there's so much hate. So, so much danger, so much unhappiness inside of this, of this, this country that created different perceptions from people outside and people inside. And it's, it's difficult. It's difficult when you see those conflicts of people that used to be together or people that used to go to Venezuela and visit and feel that there's not, it's not the same in the relationship with their families or how they feel in the country or how they are seen. And that's the thing that we all have experienced once we go back to Venezuela. And most Venezuelans relate with what I'm saying. Wow. I grew up in South Africa and I left like 20 years ago just because I was like, I was a youngster, you know, and I was like, cool, I'm going to go travel the world and, and see what else is out there. But just before I had, before I left in South Africa, they started having electricity issues uh, whereby you'd have like, okay, an hour where you don't have electricity. These days in South Africa, they have up to 10 hours a day where they don't have electricity. So there's this gradual slide you know, and now I think water is starting to become a bit of an issue there as well. Um, you know, like I hate to see it and I hate to almost say, say it, but it, it, it feels like this is gradual kind of slippery slope into almost where, you know, say Venezuela is, is now. Um, was it, was it like that from what your parents say? Was it like this, like gradual sort of decrease of everything or was it like much more kind of instant? It was instant, in my in my opinion. Was um, my parents told me that there were always problems in rural areas. It's always in different countries, but the instant was the but uh, after two thousand and eight, two thousand and nine, 
when Chavez started to expropriate businesses, I was like 19 years old and I remember Zara, Forever 21, they were shut down in 2009. Many of these American businesses, they were shutting down in Venezuela and it was taking place with the services as well. I remember that the only channel I was able to see, to watch in my dad's house, it was just a, a beach, the national chain where Chavez was speaking for 12 hours. And when he finished speaking, the electricity always went off and we were without electricity for eight to nine hours. And I, I thank God I was living in the mountains. I was living in a fresh area. But think about areas that it was warm or was really hot that people couldn't sleep because of the humidity and there was no way to have the electricity for the heating, the cooling system, you know, those details. Um, but more and more, I remember that in the hospitals when this happening, this many people die. Um, the other day I was talking with my friends that all of us with experience in 2013, um, many funerals, I I can tell you, I went to around 11, 13 funerals in a year. And it was because people were dying, uh, not having medications, and the water conditions was pretty bad. Um, people were not having, like, uh, in the hospitals, when they go to the hospital, they were not able to, you know, be assisted, and they, they die. Um, a friend of mine, he died when he was 13 years old. I was 13. He was in the same class. And... He was, I met him through my, my father and many things like that during that year, uh, plus the manifestations that when the government also killed many people with the military power that they had, um, they killed many young students in the first uh, manifestations. But all of this was consequences because every time there were manifestations, they were uh, people that were racing because I, I believe that Venezuelans did their best that they could and nobody can can come to judge uh, that we did in our best because we did. Many young population of my age, uh, they were 16, 17, they, they, they were killed. I went to different funerals during those years and during those years when we were in the funerals, electricity was cutting off, um, the water system as well, and the food. There was never food for us. And it was difficult times. I, I was raised through difficult times. Um, but, you know, it's not my only my story. I think uh, all Venezuelans can feel that um, and we can recognize that, um, that it was a uh, rough time that we, we all decide just to advance and know that it was uh, in the history, but nobody's talking about. Wow. Well, it so, certainly uh, builds character and kind of resilience and I, I suppose has prepared you well in many ways for for the tough world you know that, that is out there uh just, just another question around that did they also control like in terms of what you could say and, and information that was coming like in the country and and what you could watch and all these sort of things absolutely um let me tell you in 2014 it was a crime to use twitter in venezuela um, I have friends that they went to prison and they were tortured by the government by using Twitter. I was also a student in political science years later, and I can tell you, I don't know, and that's what I always tell to people, I don't know what happened to these certain students that were standing with me and they were using Twitter, they were outspoken and they disappeared. We never know if they were killed. We never know if they leave the country. We never know if they ask for an asylum. We only know they disappear. And this situation happens pretty often during my years of high school in university. And I'm not, um, I, one of the things that I, I never leave a high school normal thing. Because when we're, we were always in high school or we went in, our, in the university, they tend to always change the books. So the information that we were receiving in the books were all managed by the government and there were specific tests for us um, that we needed to pass in order to pass certain years. Example, in Venezuela, um, it, it's a, let's say, not, it's like a crime if you don't pass something called 
um, pre-military pre -military studies. It's for two years that you go to the school, but you have militaries teaching you how to become a military and how to speak and how to write things and how to speak about the government. Um, all of us from Venezuela, we needed to pass those exams. If we couldn't, we couldn't get graduated. And what basically is, is literally all guys need to, you know, have the hair or like shaved. Women cannot have uh, like nails, anything. It's just the military. And yeah, it's, it's, uh, I, it's, it's like a, that fear that all of us, we feel uh, in Venezuela when we were in those transitions that we weren't able to speak bad about the government we were able to use social media and they were everywhere. They were in the schools, they were in the universities, they knew the targets, they knew their families and all their targets were students or people of my age. And yeah, so I can tell you that yeah, Twitter was a crime. Speaking on the phone about the government was a crime. And many students that were outspoken, their phones were intercepted at that time and they could they could they could listen. There were also uh, snipers in our cities. My was I was born in the city of San Cristobal, and I remember during manifestation that anyone that was arriving late at home, there were snipers like this in the houses with the green light. So it's not a light that Venezuelans have been killed even in their houses. It's not a lie that they have been even, the, the students disappear and communication or any type of thing was just a way to control the society in Venezuela. And they did it. They completely put the fear and the only choice was to leave. Whoa. What is it like now for you? Do you almost like fear talking about this like you know or like say going back is is there still that sort of like okay well you know they're keeping an eye on you no i mean at this point um i know i know body right um back in the years i have uh, i had uh, an experience really interesting in caracas venezuela but it because i was a student so i was the type of outspoken student because i couldn't um accept all that all that situation see my father that he worked for so many years his salary was devalued uh we didn't have food in the house my dad one day was i remember the day that my dad gave me a soup and it was just potatoes and just uh and just the, the cilantro that was the day when i realized this is not right this is not how I, we should be living our life life is beautiful for being living this. And back in those days, I remember that it was uh, in Caracas. I was finishing part of a Congress in order to pass to the second year of, of political science and law. And the militaries arrived to our hotels and they arrested all the students and they target different women. And those women were me. And when I was taking the elevator, there were three men and they knew my name. They knew who was my father, who was everybody in the, in this. And of course I started to have that anxiety and they just told me to stop, to stop speaking bad about the government because I was already part of the target of the students that they were looking for. And I returned to San Cristobal and I decided to actually quit my studies and just to be focused on languages. So that was one of my experiences. Never happened to me anything else, but it was enough for me to realize that I needed to protect my family and the best it was to stay in silence. It's just, I mean, it's mind blowing. Just, just even thinking that, that, that was, um, something that's, that's happened to you in life. Um, I, you said that you went to, um, in two, I think it was, uh, 2000 and I forget the year exactly, 2013, maybe, uh, you went, uh, you were part of an, uh, uh, an organization called Rotary and, uh, you managed to actually get, um, 
part of their sort of exchange system, um, sort of part of their, their, their side of um, their organization. And you went to spend a year, was it a year in France or was it like three months? Like, That's like, right. It's amazing that even with all this craziness going on that you had this opportunity. So, I mean, tell me about that. It must have really opened your eyes and just changed everything for you. Of course. Well, all Venezuelans of my generation, again, our focus was to leave, to leave. This is not our country, to leave. We need to get out. Since I was 11, I mean, I'm telling you the expropriation of Chavez, it was 2009, right? Um, two, three years later, my mom, she works as a secretary in a, in a public school. And she asked to a father where his daughter, because he, she had like a rendezvous and she was giving papers to one of, the, uh, one of his sons because the father had two sons. And he replied that one of the daughters is living in Netherlands. And my mom knew her. It was how she lived in Netherlands how you did it. It was with Rotary, go to their Rotary organization and I'm pretty sure they can give you information. My mom arrived that day and she told me, hey, you want to live in the Netherlands? I made a story and it could be great if we go to Rotary organization. And I was like, yes, because I was always, you know, I was always with my English books. I was always the best keto at school. I was always super focused. Like a, I was always creating habits that the only thing the government couldn't take of me was what I have here because they took everything. But my parents always was study because that's the only thing you will have here. And my mom took me to Rotary. I met wonderful doctors that actually they introduced to me to other people and other teenagers that were going to be like in the competition. So since I was 11, I was visiting different activities that Rotary was creating, like um, different things to help people to give them food. We were raising funds, everything. So I learned so much about how to fundraise in an organization, how to connect with people, how to be elegant, how to be in the etiquette, all those things that I never learned. I was obligated to represent myself in such a big organization like Rotary. So th during those years were really hard, were really, really hard for me because I never knew how to eat the salad. I never knew how to eat the, the wine that sometimes they gave you just to try. All that classic things that in their world, nothing happened. But when you go to reality, it's something else, you know? Um, I, when I saw that opportunity, I, 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 one day I spoke with my parents and I told them it's time for me to, to take this. And thanks God, my father was always paying attention to my progress in high school and they promoted me years back. So I was able to finish high school really early age. So when the Rotary organization was having is also the crisis of Venezuela, they decided to close the positions, like the seats. So they were just, oh, they were able to send only at this time, 20 students. And when I was competing, I was competing with 300 students in all over Venezuela. So what I was always like conscious is if there were many kids with so many parents that had the power to influence those decisions, I could have the influence with my personality in something different. And then my, my dad said, you know what? I know you want that. Let me make sure that I can find some money and, and you can start an oratory course. And then you can learn how to speak on radio and then you can make a good, great performance for the final show to be selected in those 300 kids. So for years, for a year, when I was 13, my dad put me in the radio and I met beautiful people that actually did live in Argentina right now. And they are my friends. And I learned how to speak. I was learning how to manage a social event. Um, my dad included me in theater shows in order to, for me. I mean, that's what I'm telling you. When I had the support of my parents, they trust my, you know, that desire. 
Um, yeah, that's how I actually achieved that. Um, it was one of the hard moments of me as a as a as a child, but uh, as a teenager. But I got it, and after I got selected, I got selected in position eight, and out of three hundred people. And then my position, people were trying to take it with influence, doctors here, doctors, because Rotary is an organization of doctors, basically. And I was always speaking with the governor of that district and telling him, you don't know how much I've been doing since I was 11 to be here. Don't take that. That is mine and it's, it's my destiny to do it. And I remember the governor called my father and he said she's gonna go to France with everything paid, no worries about her. Um, it was a best experience. Years later, I paid everything back to my dad, courses, the radio, everything that he invested in me, I gave him back like a gift of, hey, this is what I give you and to my mom. This is what I give you as a gift that you trust me during crisis of Venezuela, but you gave me light during those <laughs> horrible times. So. Yeah, that's <laughs> yeah. What, what a fantastic story, you know. Um, I yeah. mean, like amazing what your parents did, and just having that belief in you, and uh, going to the radio and and learning those skills. I mean, your your dad definitely, um, definitely knew something, you know. And uh, I can imagine he must be so proud, and your mom as well. I think, uh, yeah, you you've definitely. Uh, Jeez, you just made them the, the proudest parents ever. So, so what was it like actually being in France though? Did you, did you have a great time? Did you learn French when you were there? What was it like? That's my second life, I would say. That's the beginning of my second life. Yes, I learned French. Um, I had the opportunity. I believe that God is in every step I do. Um, the people that uh, welcomed me in France is they became my adopted parents. I just visited them three months ago, three, four months ago. Um, I can tell you just like this, that year they literally adopted me as their daughter. In what, in what sense? They invited me to everything. They taught me their habits, everything. And I started to even live like them. And for example, how to make the table, how to speak proper French, how to say things correctly, what to read, how often to read. They teach me everything as an European family. And I became like a little bit European because of them. And we were living in a rural area. So that year for me was the, is when I knew that when God has a purpose on you, God will make you find that people. And Thanks to them, when I returned, my hope it was, was always to see them again, to tell them that they gave me the best year of my life and they gave me the unconditional love I was missing from my parents. They gave it to me. So I found European parents that were waiting for a little girl and it was the, the best experience thanks to them. I was able to participate also in gymnastic programs and I won like a small um, a scholarship in France. So I won a second like medal, a silver medal to go to represent the rural area and represent France <laughs> in, a, in a competition. Of course, that's another level, but because always my parents from Venezuela took me to gymnastic lessons and you never know when you're gonna be needing this. That's exactly when I knew that I needed those skills in France. And that's how I was actually making a little bit of money without a scholarship during that, that year. <laughs> that's such a cool story. Uh, I can see <laughs> like your, your face lights up, you know, when you talk about this sort of second life, I guess. Um, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, obviously it was just, just such a great experience. Uh, yeah. You went back to uh, Venezuela, and there was there was a story I heard you you speak about when you knew it was time to leave uh, when you were standing in the queue to buy a chicken. So I was wondering if you could explain that. Yeah, when I returned to from France, of course, I was unable to stay. And um, as a Venezuela underage girl, it's impossible in the French law, obviously. So my ticket 
my ticket back, a sad face, but hoping that all that knowledge they gave me, it will be for the future, right? When I returned to Venezuela was was a nightmare. I remember arriving to the airport, was it pretty empty? People were crying, just saying goodbye. Uh, on the other side, obviously, I couldn't understand why people were looking so thin, 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 like the thing, like awful. And I see my father with my family and they were having like a welcome gabby. Um, they even were not looking happy, but they were trying to do their best to show me that everything will be okay. So when I arrived, I remember that the supermarkets uh, were very often closed because of, uh, let's say, the government was always checking if the price was in the right price. So they were controlling the price. So it means that the supermarkets were always all like closed. Um, so my dad told me that the situation is getting worse and we don't know what to do. So I told him, no, I started working. I was 16 years old when I arrived because I finished high school at 15 because of my father's help to improve my school, my skills in at school as well, as well. So I, one of my uncles told me that they were looking for a French teacher on a kindergarten. That's when I went, I told him, hey, I don't know how to, how to be a teacher, but I want to learn. And that was uh, the beginning of everything. Um, they hired me. Uh, it was like a privileged school in my city where just uh, wealthy people could go, including government people or political people. So it was an interesting time because... When I was even giving lessons, there were <laughs> the people, the guards in the lessons for kids that they were three, four years old. And when I was there, always finishing those lessons, I was always going to the supermarket. And that was uh, one of my first moments when I, when I couldn't buy that chicken with my money that I won one of the first months because it was not enough. The exchange rate changed the same day. And I was doing a queue for about one hour. And when I was going to pay to the cashier, she told me it's insufficient funds. And when I checked, it was true because my money was the value. And I was not able to bring the chicken to my house. That was the moment when I realized that I was at the complete reality from what I lived in France, from what everybody's living outside of Venezuela, it was the reality completely different to what I was living. And that was the moment I said, this is not for me. I deserve more. I deserve a good chicken. I deserve a good meat. I deserve a drinkable water, you know? And I turned 17. And I was already planning ahead how to leave Venezuela. And, um, but in the meantime, of course, I needed to do things. I needed to improve. I said, okay, I know I'm going to leave Venezuela in a year. What are the things I need to start doing? I said, the food is a priority. I should, uh, I should go to the public university to see if there's any vacancy uh for languages and in that way I can use the the lunch area which it was a which public but enough for me to go back to work so that's how actually I leave for a year before turning 18 go to a public university have my lunch there go back to work and my dad could eat at home that was the love I could give at that moment Wow. Yes, I almost like, I almost want to cry, like just listening to to that struggle. Um, yeah. You, you're clearly like a, yeah, just a beautiful, a beautiful lady um, with a, with a big heart. And um, I can, I can really feel and I can see like the emotion um, from just, just speaking about that. Uh, so when you were 18, you, you left 
um, and you went to to Colombia, but you didn't even tell your parents. I mean, you're crying now, but I can only imagine talking about this is going to make make uh, make you more emotional. Um, are you? Yeah, do you mind speaking? No, about I'm. That? Uh, yeah, it's all right. I mean, it's hard to go back and see how blessed I am. Um, nowadays, my life it's the dream how the dream life I has I have. Um, I want to say that it's uh it's just cry I cry just the of, of joy, no. Um, it's just to feel proud of the unconditional love I feel from family, and when you're raised under so much uh, under regimes, you have two options: just to be in that area, or just to you know shine, or just to go outside and you know what you deserve, and. I I remember when I left Colombia, I didn't want to tell anything. Um, actually, all my friends <laughs> felt that they thought at that time because I was studying also political science and all that. It was, I mean, I was trying just to do different things in order to be focused in good things. And when I left, um, when I left Colombia, my my friends thought that I was arrested or something happened to me which it was, uh, yeah, it, it was really interesting. My, um, my, my transition to go to Colombia because there were manifestations at that time again. And I went to Colombia and I started to live in Bogota when it was the first time I knew I was capable of working as a freelancer. I worked in different fields like a uh, um, French teacher obviously, because I was able to speak the language. I was able to work as an English teacher. I was able also to create like documents with secretaries. I was taking care of babies. I did different jobs. And um, one day um, I remember that I was walking and a lawyer told me that he needed English lessons for uh, the, her two kids. And that lawyer gave me job for seven months with the two kids. And thanks to that job, allowed me to go and connect with different jobs and jobs and jobs and jobs. So that's what I see when, when you trust yourself, you trust your skills, you know what you are focused on. I started to see that I was able to develop also courses because in Venezuela, I developed a French course to sell to my neighbors or English courses. But it was another field in the Colombian uh, society because when I realized that I could actually understand how different uh, clients could work. And I was always telling to my parents once I told them not in Colombia, but I'm trying to figure out. Um, they were always trusting that everything will be fine everything everything that I was doing it was for for returning home you know? that was always their hope that I was gonna find in a way to uh find those resources and go back home and it was really hard not to tell my parents that <laughs> my intention was to stay in other places but never Venezuela I was there hard hard to for me during those transitions I can imagine it was tough you know you almost like as much as you love your parents, you're kind of like lying to them or, or not lying to them. You're just not telling them the full truth in, um, you know, knowing that, okay, cool. Uh, this is my lucky break. I'm just going to make the most of it. Um, sounds like you, you know, you talk about manifestation and, and you obviously, uh, are the type of person that, um, gives out this good vibe, good energy. And you brought in a lot of this, uh, luck, so to speak in inverted commas, you know, um, through through who you are and I think people obviously gravitate towards you you know like just through the you know the the jobs that it sounds like you got you know through the lawyer and um the awesome people that you uh, had as your uh, your French parents and stuff and another story which seems to have changed your life a little bit is you were living in uh these like I think it was like a house but it was just a house for kind of like a woman and uh, the guy that owned it was an 83 year old man and he sounds like he was a great mentor for you as well. And also just opened your eyes to the world. Can you, can you talk about that man a bit? 
Yes, of course. So it was really interesting because I was living in his daughter's house, but he was like there. So it was a huge house in Bogota. I It was interesting because um, he was always seeing me arriving really late or with the students or always with my books because I was always like, arriving with books or speaking in French you know, on the phone. And he was that he was saying that I was really weird in but in a good way weird like this girl is unusual what is she doing here she's speaking languages she's like you know really determined he was always telling me those things and one day he called me because he was reading the newspaper and he told me do you know that your money is going to be devalued in the same situation you live in Venezuela is going to be happening to you here in Colombia and in any in any part of the world <laughs> it was like that and I was going to work and he said like do you have clients to, today I'm gonna teach you to actually to to know better about about something that you can do and I was like about what he was like you should invest in bitcoin invest in bitcoin what is bitcoin I'm like cancel all the lessons and I will teach you I mean, if an 83 years old with a newspaper telling you <laughs> that your money is not going to be valued in any part of the world, you should listen, no? <laughs> you should listen. So he sat down with me and he explained to me that he was a doctor, economy, but he speak different languages. He knew what I was talking, things like that, you know. And he lived many years in Chile during the years of Pinochet because he was a doctor in an organization for, you know, for an organization back in the days like Rotary. And he was working there. But during Pinochet government, because it was really hard or difficult for him, he returned. This man was a Bible, I would say, of 300 years. He knew about everything knew everything he always told me never wear makeup <laughs> never uh it never stop eating meat and buy bitcoin all of this he was really wise at his age and in a week he explained to me all the macroeconomics so it was all what he learned in venezuela plus the guidance about economics that everybody's realizing in 2024 this man in a week explained to me the cause of inflation and the consequences in a society, how it declines. For me, it was a gift because I knew something was speaking to me. Something was telling me, you have something, you have something to learn from here, from, from this moment. This house that I was living was not a coincidence. This person was not a coincidence. Those calls were not coincidence. And after I got my papers in Colombia, and I helped my dad to find all those documents because that's another rabbit hole I took because we were needed to find my, my grandma because we were descendants from Colombian people. My dad needed to go to Colombia because in Venezuela, the regime didn't want anyone to have even papers from any embassy so it was a chaos so I needed to find ways in Vene in Colombia first to send him money first to understand Bitcoin <laughs> and then even to help him to go to Colombia and get the documents and once I get the documents I bought some Bitcoin at that time with local Bitcoin I remember and he said never sell never sell and don't buy anything else that is that because microeconomics at the end shows that is the most the, that is just the one that is going to be allowing you to understand things and he was right he was right um i listened to him he was a fundamental part of that chapter and he was paying attention to everything he was doing and I understood that there are people that is watching you and uh, sometimes people want the best like he wanted and others sometimes don't want. But in this case, because I know something powerful was protecting me, that was a sign for me to change my reality.
Sounds like you might have met Satoshi. <laughs> Everybody said that. <laughs> <laughs> are, you, are you still in touch with this man by any chance? I feel, I went to Bogota to try, but nobody knew. Nobody know. So I, 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 unfortunately, I wasn't able to stay in touch. They left the house after I got my papers. And I went to, to see if the, the daughter was there, but nobody. But I would laugh if he's alive. I mean, I, I'm pretty sure I feel he's alive. I, I'm sure he will live a hundred years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's amazing, man. Yes, yeah, see, the, the world has truly awesome ways of sort of synchronizing things and bringing people into our lives and and teaching us and that's uh wow that's a story for the books i swear you'll be telling your your grandchildren that story one day and um hopefully sharing the wisdom like that with with other people too as you are now on the podcast you know um one <laughs> thing i would like to just ask you a little bit about before we kind of move into you know what you're doing now like business wise um was you, you also spent a year in russia and, you know, like, I think, I mean, my, I've been to Moscow and I had a great time and I think Russians are, are cool people. And, um, you know, uh, I think people maybe have a misconception sometimes about, uh, what Russia is like, uh, could you speak a bit about that? Yeah, sure. Russia for me was an amazing place for me to know what I wanted. I was traveling at that time because. I was young as well, and I invested at that time in Bitcoin. And it was how actually I was living in Russia. I arrived there um, working as, a, as an English teacher. And for me, it was an exceptional time living in Russia. Why I'm saying that helped me to know what I wanted. First of all, in Russia, where I was living, it was in the south of Russia. It was Krasnodar. And it was pretty interesting for me not to see men around there. It was my first time living with no men. And I couldn't understand that if I took a bus, nine out of 10 were women. So it was an interesting year for me to know that I, I was seeing also women also but with babies. So I saw that in this population, there were many militaries or women that are married with militaries. And they just arrived in different systems from October to December. And for me during that time, I didn't experience the cold weather because it was the South. It was more European. It was close to country of Georgia. So it was fine. But the type of food or the type of conditions that they leave Russians really hard. In what way? I understood that we cannot judge other people how, how they look like before knowing even how they were raised. If you go to Russia, you will see that the buildings are pretty in the 50s, 60s. That's how they look. They don't have any way to have the windows with electricity or with, I mean, sorry, the windows with the light. The electricity sometimes it could be unstable, right? But people Russian, once they open up their heart, they invite you to their families and they rest with you forever. No matter in the distance, I still have my Russian friends. And they 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 are so straightforward. They when they were asking me questions, I understood that in a sense I was lost and I needed to go on track of what was my purpose and thanks to them thanks to that how honest they are but how their heart is which is really good people help me in everything i believe that this is the type of people that allow me to see all the reality of the west and that's why i have them in my heart because Russia is also part of the people, it's part of the food, it's part of the condition of life that they have. But also, it's uh, fundamental to know that all the information we receive on this part of the world is not the same when you see another perception and you see other things in another, uh, like an objective way. Um, I saw why Russian thinks in the way they think 
like I, there are others that are against the mindset, like there are others that they don't care, like, like any part of the world. But I generally think Russians has a really way to see their life differently from the West. And those traditional values were the ones that got me in the right track to say, thank you. This is what I needed to learn. I return because I want, I feel ready because of this. So even if I was having this, uh, if uh, these uh, amazing trips and all of this because of Bitcoin, Russia was the essential point of my life to know that the traditional values maintain a society and a structure of them. And I was, I was able to ask questions to know what they think about that. And all of them were right because in 2024, I'm seeing that. And it was an interesting year. Russia is an interesting country when you know people better and you don't judge them, you just feel and listen and you take the good. And also you understand that they were raised in really hard conditions as well. It's not a, it's not a easy life even for Russians, but that's why they are how they are. Yeah, absolutely. What, what you said was, um, was spot on. And, um, I think it's like, there's so many lessons in there, you know, like, first of all, you know, we have no idea. Obviously you do, you've lived there now, you know, and, and, you know, people that are from the outside, you don't necessarily have any idea what people say from Russia are living like Venezuela, South Africa, uh, you know, whatever, a lot of these countries that, um, that there's been heavy struggles, you know, and it's never for us to judge. And you know what? It, actually, every single country, I believe the people are, the people are great. And it's, it's only really the governments that are, that are the issues. They cause, you know, they, they cause everything that, um, you know, people don't want a lot of the stuff in the world. Almost everything in the world that's happening, people don't want. But you have these maniacs running the world uh, and in power and um, ruining it for everybody. Um, you know, they're holding on by a thread. I, I, I truly believe that we are here all together on, on earth at the moment to sort of fight this fight and to, to live a, a very prosperous life. Um, it's going to be a bit of a battle still, but, um, but totally uh, it's going to be worth hanging on for that's for sure. So like you said, we must keep those, those traditional values, the structure, we mustn't let this sort of segregation of society when it comes to, you know, people talking about their, their pronouns and their different genders and this and that, like, don't let that segregate us. We have to understand that this is military brainwashing, right? And it's intentional. Um, it's going to be hard to kind of navigate that because people don't really listen to each other these days that much. Uh, we need to still listen. We need to sort of be compassionate and we need to understand that not everyone sees the world the same way. You know what I mean? Um, but we, we together, we, we need each other and we will come through this. So thanks for sharing that about Russia. I think, um, yeah, really, really cool. I'd like to read something that you, you recently wrote, um, on, on Twitter. You're right. You wrote, Today I'm 25 years old in the beautiful city of. Buenos Aires, Argentina. Happy birthday, by the way. Um, I, I, want, <laughs> I want to take a moment to say thank you to this big community who has helped me to reach more than 5,000 subscribers and helped me to provide educational services. This year, I welcomed 112 students. I hired nine teachers from all over Latin America. I got 25 million impressions on social media. I cooked and celebrated with beautiful housewives and mothers that allowed me to create beautiful relationships with them. I met beautiful people. I help businesses to grow and expand in the US. We opened Global Portuguese, the first unlimited Portuguese school online. This social media platform is powerful and it is because of you I've received such big opportunities. Gracias por tanto. So you're a polyglot, which means that you speak um, and converse in many languages. Um, you also run a business teaching uh, people to speak Spanish and Portuguese now. So can you just Tell us a little bit about your business and how it came about. Sure. So um, traveling and all of this, I developed a great way, a method where people can actually take unlimited one-on-one -on -one lessons in global Portuguese. We were actually the first uh, is, is school online 
that someone can learn with a teacher, which is a native, and feel comfortable with speaking the language. So we have a curriculum, we have a structure, you have uh, professional teachers that are hand picked up. And also what we provide, the difference of any other academies is that we focus on your need and, what, and if you don't have a need, we help you because that's going to be accelerating the process because people, when they just find them as a hobby, there's no hobby behind a learning long process. It's like going to the gym. It's not a, like it's not a hobby. When this, when you want to serve results is because you actually want to put the effort and what is the right way? How, what is the struggle that you have most? And that's what we help you in Global Portuguese. And actually, uh, we are promoting right now that unlimited lessons for everyone that wants to also subscribe. So, um, like, what separates you, like, uh, from other, say, just schools that, uh, that also teach uh, languages? Like, is it the way you teach, how you teach, what you teach? Yes, so the academies, we have two, we are two, Global Spanish and Global Portuguese, but the, how it differentiates from other schools, first of all, is that we have professionals in the area. They are polyglots as well. They are not just teachers that is, are bilingual. We have people that speak other languages and they already know about the method, which is the, the help you finally to speak the language, the conversational skill. How is that? We create you an alter ego. So the alter ego is from the first lesson, like Beyonce. Beyonce go to a stage, right? But she is Beyonce. But when she's not on a stage, she is Mr. Carter, no? Miss Carter. So it's when you, in the future, when you are speaking the language, how you project yourself. So in the language, you are, you're confident, you're intelligent, you're adventurous, you're smart your flirtatious, all the things, all the character of this alter ego will help you to accelerate. And when we create this in you, automatically it's like your brain change and you start learning fast with this method. And then we help you to interact in this character. So when you get into the character with all the material we provide you and we say, okay, now it's time for you to record yourself and listen to yourself. So it's amazing how we see students changing even the personality when they record and when they change to English. So for them, it's like an experience also to connect with other students also in our lessons. Of course, all of them are private lessons. But people have also the possibility to go into a networking area where they can also interact with other students in our different groups. And that's what we do. The main goal is to also help you to connect with a major group that has the same focus and has the same strategy to help you to communicate the language. So you're not alone on the, pro on the process. We have 20,000 people learning uh, Spanish and also Portuguese in our groups. And you can always reach out to us if you want to have even a body or if you just want to keep practicing. Global Spanish provide you this. And it's already including as a lifetime access, which is something that nobody believed that it's possible. But we have been growing in the past five years now. And that's what I'm proud of, that we're able to provide lifetime access, which is other academies don't provide. And that's sensational, 20,000 people going through it that's that's really impressive um yeah i was uh, i was wondering are they when you said uh, alter ego is that based on like todd herman i don't know if you if you've heard of todd herman he's written a book called alter ego specifically about what you're talking about i have read many books but i don't know if uh if it's that the one is it's a green it's a green one no it's a yellow one a yellow one actually no, I read one that is that is green, but I have read different ones about alter egos. But no, very, very interesting. Know. It's it's a really cool like um sort of switch, isn't it? Uh, in in mindset to to help people, um you know become who they they want to become. Um, so I hadn't even considered it for languages. I really like that. Uh, I was wondering, like, is there are there fundamentals? to learning a new language i've watched a lot of tim ferris um he's also um a polyglot and he he has like some really cool ways of kind of like 
uh, I guess, quickening your, uh, the way, uh, how you, you know, to, to, to sort of improve your, your speaking of a new language. Um, he says there's often many words that are quite similar, um, but they'll have like different endings. Um, and you can kind of match those up, you know, and he's like, often in, you'll have like a few hundred, a few thousand words that are like that. It's like, you know, those sort of things, are there, are there fundamentals to learning a language that, that you find help people? Yeah, like, for example, um, all languages come from the Greek structure. The Greek structure, uh, structure comes from mythologic things. Mythologic uh, things or concepts come from polarity structures. Polarity structures come from the divine structure of a human being. So there are many components of any language. If you see it on the way how it has been developed, you're going to be able to learn any language. Let me explain. Um, languages have certain aspects that people, if they, people didn't notice, but that's how the language has been created with certain purposes back in the history. Um, for example, the Greek language is one of the major ones that connect with all the language that we currently speak. And if you go to the roots of the new Greek language, for example, you will notice that when they speak the moon faces in Spanish, we also speak with certain terminologies with the moon faces of the days of the week and also how so even the emotions or even the feelings, right? So there are uh, those are structures that anyone um, can notice until you practice different languages. And yes, let me say like an example. There are languages like Spanish, French, Italian that has what is masculine and feminine. So all of this is, is completely unto the analogy of the human body, let's say. Like in order to have a human being, we need both components. The same with the language. That's why it's romantic. That's one of the aspects that I said. The other aspect, there are certain words in those different languages that are fully feminine because even back in the history, it was created by women or it was because it was used by women or it's because how soft or how tender it is or how psychological, in a psychological way, how people describe the, language, the things can acquire. Let me give an example. It's not the same to say, for example, like the example, una planta, a flower or a plant, because in Spanish, everything that is nurtured, everything that is soft is feminine. La planta, la flor, la estrella. But if you explain about a bridge, you're going to say in this English language that it's just this helps to people to go to one way to the other. But the speaker in the language that we're talking in this case will be Portuguese or Spanish. They will say, it's large, it's long, it's beautiful, it's strong. So they define as a man or as a woman. So when you understand or you see that pragmatic ideas of languages, you will see why languages or why people behave on this way and why people are on the other way. Because it has a pragmatic sense in the language structure. The way you explain it, like, makes it like sound like a, a beautiful way to learn. You know what I mean? You almost like romanticize uh, language. I hadn't even like necessarily heard it expressed that way. So it almost like gets me like excited. You know, as, as someone who, okay, I want to I want to throw this out there. Like, are people? Um, do you have a language brain? Uh, or like a, say a mathematical brain, like, like, cause I always think, okay, I, I kind of feel like I've struggled with languages. I, I grew up in South Africa and we had to learn three languages at school. Um, and, uh, when I went to, Sp when I went to South America, I found that I, um, you know, I, I picked up Spanish, but like, and, but coming to Portu Portuguese, um, Brazil, like Portuguese, I haven't really picked it up that, that well at all. Um, but I, I always like use the excuse. I've got like a mathematical brain. Is that just like a really bad excuse or do people have mathematical brains and, um, you know, language brains, so to speak? There's a, there's something called cognitive, cognitive science, which is, uh, is where it goes to the language brain and it's how we store information. 
So when we speak about our brain in the way how we see things, it's correct. It's the way how you actually can relate to information. There's people that I can actually relate with colors, artists, mm -hmm. mathematics. That's why it says engineering, but also it says poets, poetry. So yes, the cognitive science is, the, is defined by certain uh, skills that you develop within time, but also how good you see the world and you create it in that material area, in a material way. That's why engineers can see it and create things to engineer. For example, we can make those sounds to make them more, uh, we can see them, the sounds of the languages. But there are other people that all those components can create a beautiful literature. Mm -hmm. that nurtures the soul. So yes, absolutely. There's a cognitive science that relates to this, but also it's more deep than we think. It's also part of a, of a, of a structure that we, that we already have through the experiences that we also have in the knowledge, how we, how, how we acquire knowledge. You clearly have like gone deep into, to languages, um, I was wondering once I heard from somebody that you said now like a lot of languages stem from the Greek, the Greek sort of language. But I was also once heard that actually a lot of language or one of the first earlier languages is actually based on Slovak languages. Is is there any truth in that? Do you know? I haven't I haven't checked that from what I know and from what I can relay with the museums that, that are in Greece about the language structure is that the ancient civilizations are actually in Greece, that's, I mean, in this area, because in those areas, um, all the languages, they, they stay in different arts and you can tell that it's still in those different arts, they were evolving in different languages, but they look similar to Slavic. So it might be possible that there's a history that we don't know that it could be was erased because we didn't know what was the benefit. Remember that all the story has been changed, but it might be possible. Um, I'm just I haven't taken that rabbit hole that deep, um, but it might be possible that the Slavic language could was the one. And it could I, it could be true because if we see back in society, this type of um, society was the one that were in conquerors. They were also going to different areas and they were the big people that even Bible speak about. So if the Bible is speak about this, there's, there's the truth of that. Yeah. I think, I mean, not saying think... that in a religious way, I'm just saying that back in the days, the ancient books speak more about the big huge people in this normally comes from islamic the yes, islamic no, area yeah. no no totally totally I, I i agree and um i think it's interesting because people are culturally um patriotic you know so so depending on like who you're asking you know like if you're asking somebody say from like eastern europe they would probably go yeah no it's you know it's from the slavic language or you go to to greece they'll go yeah it's from it's from us um it's like if you're in Brazil now, like they're like, oh no, well, you know that we actually invented the airplane. It wasn't the Wright brothers and stuff. So, you know, there's, there's all like these different versions of history and and um, patriotism that that we need to consider, especially when it comes to all history. You know, like we never know what the absolute truth is. There's definitely probably more than one or two, um, which is which is a good lesson in everything, just to keep like an open mind and kind of everything that we learn and and yeah, um, which allows us to kind of like remain interested, you know, like and open to different opinions. And, and I think that's an important thing for all of us to do in life. Um, so just, just a couple of other things. Um, are, are like the same language uh, more beautiful, say, in different countries? So, for example, like, I mean, if you listen to Brazilian Portuguese as opposed to Portuguese, Portugal Portuguese or like I've heard that Colombian Spanish is like probably the most beautiful of all, um, you know, compared to the others. Is there, is there any truth in that? I wouldn't say in that way, if there's a truth or not, 
I would say the beauty is how it is expressed. Okay, so if you speak, but let me say in Portuguese, you don't say I miss you. You say eu tenho saudades de você. It's not the same, and you feel it. So it's, there's, a, I would say, it's the beauty just of the language. I would say that give the expression of all the language. And of course, there are accents, there are dialects, there are slams. But I wouldn't say that there's a, what is better, what is wrong at this point. I've been listening uh, foreigners speaking with Colombian Spanish, uh, Spanish, uh, Paraguayan Spanish, and all of them are hilarious, but they are cute because that showed me history, that taught, that taught me about them. And if you really want to, to know about them, you just need to listen. Um, for example, the, the, an accent that I found fascinating, hilarious, is the one in Paraguay. It's hilarious because you know that they are trying to speak Spanish, but you're not able to speak Spanish. And it's why they, they keep their uh, Guarani accent, which is from native, and they still maintain this and is in the root. So it means this is a conservative country. Without even you knowing about political things, you know it's a conservative country. When, when you make your research, oh, wow, yes, it's a conservative country. So it's not about the dialect or the accent. It's what the how it's expressed the message, and you understand why they 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 do or they say the way how they do it. Mm, I like that a lot. Yeah, it's it's so fascinating. Like once you dive deep into a subject, only then do you realize the sort of complexity, but also the beauty of it you know like like you're saying now like you you literally can tell that it's a conservative country because of how they've kept their their dialect and the way that they speak and pronounce things um and uh yeah i mean language is 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 truly a fascinating one and and has obviously you know shaped civilization and uh um yeah i mean it is it is a fascinating one i was um i was wondering uh, gabby what are you kind of most excited about and have coming up in the future that you could let us know about? Well, right now, um, 2024, that's an interesting question. Um, right now is the first time in my life I don't plan anything. I just leave my present and it's the first time I said I'm living the dream life. And uh, what I'm expecting just is to keep working in the, my businesses um, because we're growing really fast. We hire a lot of teachers the last month. We have uh, many uh, contracts that we are uh, with B2B, um, B2B partnerships, so let's say like this, and people are more trusting my brand. So the future is that more people can recognize global as a brand that is a trust brand that we can just go transferring with them and we can also help in the future more foreigners to settle down um, businesses or their residents down here in Latin America because if we are able to speak the language and you want to experience it more it's possible so that's what we are looking forward is just to expand the opportunities that we are already providing in the language but also to allow you and make you feel more comfortable wherever you go in Latin America. So that's the future goal right now. Mm, that's going to be quite an offering. So uh, yeah, I like all the best of that. And I was wondering if people wanted to get in touch with you, what's the best way for them to find out about, um, about your business and, and yourself? Yeah, sure. So actually uh, both websites, we have our chat. We were 24 seven in our chats, but also you can just create us at support at global or support at global spanish.com.co. And we're going to be there also on my Twitter profile. It's Gabby Vivas BTC. 
And uh, yeah, I mean, we also have a, a YouTube channel where I'm going to be showing also the cuisine in Latin America and explain history, the why our grandma think uh, this is a soup that is going to be, you know, putting away all the monsters. <laughs> so if you also want to subscribe to that channel, we're going to be more unhappy. Uh, but yeah, we have all the social medias and also to connect with all the businesses. We have our chats email and my personal brand Gabby Vivas BTC and that's amazing and, and my last question Gabby is uh, what does being ridiculously human mean to you it's a good question um, I believe it's a kind of purpose good to find a purpose in, in a balance through the spiritual and material I like that Gabby, I just wanted to like, just say, you know, a massive thank you. Uh, you, you mentioned now about um, trust, you know, and, and people trusting in, in your, your brand and, and not just your business brand, but your personal brand. And I mean, just through telling your story, you know, the sort of vulnerability of it, the genuineness uh, is definitely for me, how you build trust, you know, and I can, you know, I don't know how people couldn't trust you after listening to your story it is quite phenomenal you know in the far out way like what you went through and truly amazing like you know what you have done with your life and like what you've gone through to to be in the place you are now so i am totally excited for you that you're just going to spend this year going with the flow so to speak uh, because you obviously truly deserve it from everything that you've gone through. Um, you shared so much for all of us, you know, I think you opened up our eyes to what it's truly like in, you know, not just Venezuela, but uh, say Russia and, and like around the world. And I'm um, just absolutely grateful. Uh, I love this conversation. So thank you so much for joining me today on the podcast. No, and thank you for giving me the trust and make me feel comfortable and sticky about my story. Um, it was, it's not an easy one, but, uh, but thanks for your attention because to, to keep an eye or to keep on track of everything, it's an amazing job. Thank you so much for that. That made my me pleasure. feel really, really good. Thank you. Uh, my pleasure. Thank you.